Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm back at the shop with Harley and we are working on the 351 Marine engine. It's all machined. We just bumped the hone through it a little bit just to get some new fresh crosshatch. Get to work masking it all off. We'll get it ready for paint. I've already painted. Or I've started painting valve covers, intake, and the timing cover. I'm gonna get the block masked off and we'll get working on that next. We got our 351 Ford Marine engine all cleaned up, painted, completely ready for assembly. First, we're gonna knock in cam bearings, come back, do the freeze plugs, and then we'll start checking our main bearing clearance. After we do the main bearing clearance, we'll check rod clearance, ring gap, and then once everything is checked and all the clearances look perfect, we'll go ahead and assemble the short block. Next, we're gonna go ahead and put the camshaft in. And I like to put the camshaft in first before doing anything with the um, rotating assembly because we can totally lubricate every lobe of the camshaft from the top of the engine. So that way we don't have to get our hands super dirty right now putting it in. No friction at all. Cam bearings are perfectly straight. And then what I'll do is I'll come back and put a bead of lubrication over all the journals first. All five. And I'll put the slide the cam all the way into the bearing. And then I'll do a bead over all of the lobes. That way when you're sliding the camshaft in, sometimes, you know, as you slide the camshaft through the bearings, so not all of the oil will make it all the way to the back. Whereas if you do it this way, 
you're putting all the lubricant and oil on last, so you're almost guaranteed to get total lubrication on the journals, which is especially important because this is a flat tappet camshaft and not a billet steel roller or even a ductile iron roller. Next, we're gonna install the galley plugs and then we'll put our thrust plate on for the camshaft. I like to put a little Loctite inside of the bores. Whoops. Just to really help secure the galley plugs in there for the ones that are just a press fit. Some of them are threaded and you of course don't need to do any of this, but these are just press fit in an old block that's already had bearings or plugs put in and out of it. So we'll add the Loctite for a little extra security. And then for the back plug that goes into this galley port, the plugs I use have a 40 thou hole drilled inside of them. That way we get pressurized oil squirting onto the distributor gear area, which is right there. And that's gonna help give us extra lubrication to protect the gears from wearing out too quickly. And then so that we know they're torqued, I always do a little blue marker on them. That way if I need to walk away or a customer comes in the door and I come back to this, I know I've already torqued those two. This blue compound is Pioneer's Core Plug Sealant. Next, we're going to check our main bearing clearance. So we're gonna go ahead and install all the bearings and the block and the caps. And then we're gonna to torque down the caps to simulate the engine being assembled. And when you torque it down, it's gonna distort the circle. And then we'll come back and measure the diameter of the circle to find the clearance between the crankshaft and the bearing. So now I've taken my dial bore gauge and I've zeroed the gauge to match the exact diameter of the crankshaft. And what I'm measuring is the clearance between the bearing and crank. And for this engine, because it's such a low RPM, low horsepower, boat marine engine and because we're using a good block strong crank strong block we're gonna run the clearance the tolerance of our clearance can be much tighter than if it was say a 302 block going in a nitrous drag engine 
So our bearing clearance looks awesome. So we'll go ahead and drop the crank in. Add some more lubricant on top of the crank. The thrust bearing controls the crank's fore and aft movement inside the engine block. And because it does that by having flat faces that are going to go on the crankshaft on both sides. And because there's two halves, one in the cap and one in the block, those faces need to be lined up perfectly straight and not offset from each other. And so the way we do that is we just barely snug the bolts down on the cap to keep it from rising up or tilting sideways. And we're gonna take an aluminum drift and we're gonna drive the crankshaft back and then drive the crankshaft forward. And then we'll come back and torque down the bolts. Now that our thrust is set, We'll torque the bolts down and then check it with a micrometer to see exactly how much thrust we have. First, I'll just check it with the pry bar. Oh yeah. You can't feel it or hear it, but you can hear, feel, and see the, the crankshaft in person moving just slightly back and forth. I'm gonna guess right now and say we have about four to five thou thrust clearance. Put the tool on the crank, zero it out, test it a couple times, take the pry bar, yep, exactly 5,000 clearance. Here you can see it, we're at five, zero, five, zero. Perfect. And again, once we have a bolt that is torqued, I'm gonna come back and mark it so I know that this bolt is torqued down and finally installed. Next, we're gonna put the timing set on really quick. On a Ford, there's no press fit like there is on a Chevy, which makes it a little easier to install these. And both gears have dots that you need to line up together. There we 
go. You can see here that these dots on the crank sprocket and the cam sprocket are exactly lined up with each other. And then I just grab it and check to make sure that the camshaft has thrust clearance. And you can just feel it and hear it in person. Next, I'm gonna get the rods all cleaned up put the bearings inside of them and get them prepped to check rod bearing clearance before we final assemble the short block. I like to first hit the iron with steel wool to knock off any surface rust and contamination. And then I'll come back with brake clean and give it a final cleanup, as well as get these wrist pins oiled. The ultrasonic cleaner really takes the oil out of everything. So we need to come back and lubricate the wrist pins for sure. Next we'll hit everybody with some brake clean. This is when you learn where every micro cut on your thumb and fingers are. I'm going to go ahead and lubricate these wrist pins because they are a little dry from the ultrasonic cleaner. If you do the steel wool trick, you'll find that this surface just becomes glass. Almost like when you clay bar a car that's never been clay barred, you can't believe how smooth that iron can become from all the little surface impregnations and tiny microscopic little rust pockets. Pop these in our caps and our rods. Whenever you're building an engine, cleanliness is pretty much the golden rule. The cleaner you can be, just the better. And we'll take our anti-seize, and we'll put just a little on the threads. This one got a little too much. And we'll pop our caps back on. Next, we'll get these bolts all torqued down in our rod vise. Come back, check the clearance on these. So first we're going to take our micrometer and this is going to find the exact precise diameter of the journal. 
So we'll go ahead and find that first. that one check this one exact same perfect yeah, those all feel really good so we'll go ahead and lock it and now we have this measurement set exactly with the diameter of the crankshaft now we're going to bring the dial bore gauge back out and we're going to zero the dial bore gauge to this diameter. Now you'll see we are just a hair under zero actually. Back it down a little bit. Boom. Now we're a hair over. Okay, we're starting to split hairs. Each little mark on this gauge is one ten thousandth of an inch. And each singular mark, the big numerals are one thou. So this is going out four decimal places after zero. That's how accurate we're trying to set this and measure right there. So come to our rods next. And we'll make sure we all have the appropriate clearance for this application. There's never an exact answer to how much clearance an engine needs. There's rules of thumb. The most popular rule of thumb is one thou of bearing clearance per inch of journal diameter. Meaning, if the diameter of our journal is exactly two inches, we need theoretically two thou of clearance for that journal. However, that's just the rule of thumb. Every application is different. Like I said, this is a very low RPM, light duty boat engine that's only gonna make maybe 200 horsepower. So we can run our bearings a little bit tighter, clean up the efficiency of the engine, and we will never have a problem. The engine will run great for a million miles. We'll get these rod caps busted off, hang piston rings on the pistons, and then we will come over to our short to our block and turn it into a short block when we assemble it. If you are doing this yourself at home, whenever you get this bore as clean as you possibly can with brake clean or acetone or alcohol and a rag, come back with a piece of white clean paper and scrub the bore with that paper. And you'll be amazed how black and dirty that paper will come out even though you've got this totally clean with paper towels and brake clean. Little trick for you. Next, we'll come in and lubricate the cylinder walls. And we really wanna focus on pushing the oil into the cross hatch of the hone. I'm using Joe Gibbs break-in oil from his Driven Oil line. I like to use this stuff for the piston rings and the cylinder walls. And then because this is a flat tappet engine, we will break the engine in with this oil as well. My roller cam motors, we just break in with Rotella. But if it's a flat tap, but I like to go ahead and use the, use the really premium good stuff. Even though Rotella has zinc additives, the, uh, the driven break-in just has a whole bunch more. If you've watched part one to this engine build series, you know that I've numbered all of the rods 
from which cylinder they came out of. And so now I'm going to reference those numbers and reassemble this engine so that way the pistons go right back into their homes. So we'll start with piston number five. All right, now that that's all torqued, make sure the rods all have side clearance. Just a little wiggle check. Not binding up on the crankshaft radius. Everything's good. Come back, pin them all with the blue dot. Now you can see all that stud works for the oil pump pickup that I was talking about in the first video. While I was getting ready to install the timing cover and oil pan on our 351, I noticed that it had a high volume oil pump on it, which is actually incorrect. And I really do not recommend them on Ford engines, especially ones that are just regular run of the mill, nothing super special high horsepower. Uh, the high volume pumps put a lot of wear and a lot of load on the distributor gears, which on a Ford are already prone to early wear and premature failure as the gear doesn't get a lot of oil. So with our addition of the oil mod, where we're feeding pressurized oil out of the, lift out of the lifter galley onto the gear and going back to the correct standard volume pump, this distributor gear will have a full service life that'll last longer than it would if it was stock. And the high volume pump that we had also explains why the old gear had a whole bunch of wear on the distributor. So I'm gonna get the pump switched over and then we'll get the timing cover on and we'll start, keep working on the engine. If you're working on a small block Ford oil pump, the drive shaft goes into this slot and then the gasket goes onto here and then you have to flip everything upside down and install it onto the block. And what I found that really helps make this job easier is I just do a bead of assembly lube right there and then I just do a pump into that hole and that'll create like a vacuum that keeps that shaft in place and then the lube on the pump itself will help keep our gasket stuck there. That way when we go to flip this over, it all stays in place. Makes it way easier. Now we'll get our pickup reinstalled with the correct oil pump. And I'm also gonna do a different nut here. I'm gonna use a lock washer with a nylon lock nut instead of just having a regular flanged nut. Work a light. Hello, I am. Making videos or what? Making videos and motors. We'll get this timing cover loosely bolted up now. These early Fords 
the timing covers are not dialed like the late model roller blocks are. So what we do is loosely install the bolts where the cover can still wiggle. Right about there. And then we're gonna install the harmonic balancer, which is gonna square up the timing cover seal because we don't want it to be sagging to one direction and then the spring back here won't have a perfect grip on the balancer and it'll be leaky. I put a, a little bit of assembly lube to help lubricate the seal and then I do anti-seize on the inside of the hub with a dab of RTV sealant where the woodruff key goes. And we'll get this lined up. Right there. Ford balancers luckily don't have much of a press fit and you can just use the bolt to help snug it up onto the crankshaft. Unlike a Chevy where it's a very tight press fit and you have to use a balancer installer. The Fords you can get away with just using the bolt and the impact. split the difference of where that giant timing cover wants to be about right there we'll get it torqued down i believe there are many different ways to install oil pan gaskets on engine blocks um, especially small block fords small block chevys um, I don't think there's a necessarily a right and a wrong way, but I think a lot of different engine builders have found different methods that work best for them and what different results they've seen. Um, what I like to do is I take my RTV and I do little horseshoes just around the bolts themselves. And then where there's a gap right here, like the engine block going to the timing cover, I'll do just a little line right there and then continue my horseshoes. On small block Fords, they're grooved on both the front and the rear humps on the block. And so I'll do a thin bead of silicone as well over the hump on the block side. But then on the oil pan side, I'll just drag the silicone up a little bit onto the gasket, but I won't take it all the way over. Um, I found when I take the silicone all the way over on both sides of the gasket, I'll go to install the oil pan and because there's silicone on both sides, it'll squish the gasket out. So instead I just do it on the block side and then put the pan on dry, apart from a little dab here in the corners. So we'll go ahead and get this sealed up. And again, I don't think there's a right or a wrong way to do this. This is just what I have found works best for me and to ensure that I don't have any leaks with my engines. Sure. And then I always like to use OEM gaskets when available. So here we have our OEM Ford Motorcraft oil pan gasket. If there's an OEM part available for something, 99% of the time it's better than any aftermarket part and it usually costs about the same. So I'll do my little beads again. However, I'll only bring it up to right there on the humps. If we were working on something like an LS or a Coyote or any engine that has a cast oil pan versus stamped, on those engines I do not do these little horseshoes around the bolts. However, because our oil pan is stamped steel, it is very flexible. And I have found the horseshoes really help to just, just really ensure that we're not gonna have any leaks. We'll get this lined up. And then we'll start to put all of our bolts in.
When I'm doing oil pans, I like to get all the bolts threaded in first before we start to torque down. Just because we have on a small block Ford, we have 24 bolts, I believe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We have 22 bolts total on a Ford. And if you tighten down this bolt and this bolt, and then you try to go over here to this back corner and tighten them down, chances are it's probably gonna have shifted on you. So by putting all the bolts threaded first, we can basically guarantee that it'll all go smooth when we start torquing down the pan square. Also, because we're about to start torquing down on a painted surface, I'm not going to use the impact gun. The impact gun, when it ratchets, will tear off the clear coat and tear the paint up. So we're gonna put these all in by hand with a little speed wrench. I'm gonna start with the big ones. Go right until it touches, go to the next. And then I'll come to the back. Okay, once I have these snug down pretty good, we'll switch sockets and go back and start torquing all of the bolts going around the pan. And I'm not going to crisscross these. I'm just gonna step the torque up slowly. So I'll go down just until they touch, go to the next. Just until it touches with a little preload. And I'll slowly start to torque them a little bit more. All the bolts are already installed, so we don't really have a fear of twisting the sheet metal from torquing this side down before the next. And again, we're only putting maybe five pounds of torque on it with this little speed wrench. Okay, now that they're all down and snugged up to about five pounds, I'm just gonna go over them really quick a second time before we put the torque wrench on it. The big bolts, I'm only gonna torque to 17 and a half pounds. And then the small bolts, I will torque to 10 foot pounds. All right, guys, that about sums up part two of our 351 Marine build. In the next part, I'm gonna finish building the engine, put the cylinder heads together, set the valve train up, install the intake manifold, and this engine will be ready to go. Thanks for watching.